it is such a great honor to be able to, to speak here tonight, uh, this morning, to my church, right, my home church. I was telling Pastor Ryan yesterday, or uh, was it yesterday or Friday, that this is the first time I've had an opportunity to speak at my home church, where whatever I say uh, can come back to me the next week, and I'll have to account for it. So uh, just keep me in prayer, all right? Don't, don't uh, keep me in prayer. Don't let me go off the rails here, because I am accountable to you uh, next week for it. Um, I just, I, I just, it's such a great thing to be able to get up before people that you are, that you love, and that love you back. I've had probably 10 people stop me today and say, we're praying for you, we're so glad for you, um, you're going to do well, no, no, no worry, no, no, uh, no nerves or anything. And so, thank you guys so much for being such a loving family to me and to my family as we seek to follow God and what he's called us to do. Right? Uh, I, want to, I want you to open your Bible to Luke chapter 4 today. If you're using a pew Bible, that's going to be page number 727, page number 727, Luke chapter 4. And we're going to be reading from uh, verses 16 through 21. And you will recognize this from earlier in the service, right? Jesus here is quoting the passage that Pastor Ryan read during the scripture reading time. I'd like people to talk back to me. So when you have it, go ahead and say amen so I know that you have it. All right, my back home. All right. Luke chapter 4, verses 16 to 21. The word of the Lord says, He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. On rolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him, and he began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Right. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, and my God, now as we, as we prepare to dive in and learn more of you, I pray that your will be done. Lord, I have my ideas about what I would love to see happen when I'm going to preach this, Lord, but your will is perfect, righteous, and good, my God, so help us to listen, help us to learn, to grow, and to go apply these things um, on a daily basis. pray these things in your name. Amen. I, um, I went to this middle school in New York where you have to take a test to get in, and I took the test, and it's a private school, and, and they put me on a waiting list, and I was crushed at a young age. Uh, what, what did I do wrong that I was not fully accepted into the school? But though I was on the waiting list, they invited me, along with all the other accepted students, to show up at the school and just kind of have a, a, an orientation day, and they, they invited you to bring something with you that you could speak about to show them who you are. Right, something you can show and tell. Anybody done show and tell before? Right. So, so I'm thinking, man, I gotta, I gotta bring it. Right. I gotta bring something that's gonna cause these people to, to understand that they made a mistake not accepting you right out. They, you know, I'm not supposed to be on the waiting list. And so, uh, I talked to one of my teachers, one of my mentors, and, and and we used to work on science projects together. And he gave me this little motor to work on to see if I can make it work. And nobody could figure it out. I figured it out. And so I said, you know what, that's the perfect thing to bring to show and tell at this new school to show people just how much of a smart kid I was, right? Uh, somebody might call them a nerd. So um, I show up to the school that day, I have a box full of all these parts to this little bugger, I'm gonna get it going. And, and I said, nobody else is carrying anything with them. So maybe maybe it's in their backpack, maybe they're just, you know, maybe their stuff isn't that good, you know? And, uh, and we sit around a table and everybody starts going around giving their show and tell item. And almost everybody brought pictures of their family, of their dog, or they brought baseball cards, you know, and they wanted to talk about just their passion for baseball. And I all of a sudden started feeling very, very self-conscious. Because everybody seems trying to be very personal and just 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 relax, just this is who I am, and I'm I'm coming in here with this this motor that I'm gonna show everybody how to make it work. And I, I was very uncomfortable. Show and tell was not a fun day for me that day. But we made it happen, we got the motor working, and I described that I had a passion for science and all these things, and I got accepted to the school, it was a great school. Show and tell is, is, that, is that moment where 
you want to represent yourself as best as possible so you show them this is what I'm about. And you tell them what that means to you in your life. I, I, what, what, I, what I want to do today is I want to show you how the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth was a show and tell ministry. It was a show and tell ministry. He came to show the world what life would be like if we were freed from the curse of the fall. And not only to show them what it would be like, but then tell them what the greater story is. You've been hearing Pastor Ryan talk about the greater story, right? Things happen here on earth, but they have a greater significance up there in heaven and in his kingdom. And so Christ came to show and tell what life would be like if we were freed from the curse. So let's go back to the passage, Luke chapter 4, um, verse 16. That's going to be page 727. Now what's happening in the story is this. Jesus Christ... The time has come, right? The time has come. He's been alive for 30 years. He's been a, a, an obedient son. He's been a, a carpenter working for his father, working with his father. But he knows that the time has come for him to step into the work that God, his father, has called him to do. And so he, he hears about John the Baptist preaching that the Messiah is coming. And so he goes down to reveal himself as the Messiah. And so he is baptized, the Holy Spirit descends upon him, and takes him immediately to a desert where he is about to be tempted by Satan for 40 days. And after those 40 days, Jesus Christ comes out victorious, having not sinned against God. His righteousness is intact, and so it says that he comes, off of the, comes out of the desert into the cities with the power of the Holy Spirit. And he has a goal in mind. He's going back to his home church to, to, to debut his... his, his his sermon, they view his ministry to the people that know him best. The passage says later on that people ask, isn't this Joseph's son who's speaking this way? This is amazing. So they knew him personally, and he wanted to go home and let them know first. And it says that as he went home, as he walked to these towns, he performed many miracles, many amazing acts. They were so incredible that the word of his amazing acts got to Nazareth before he got to Nazareth. So they were waiting. They wanted to hear this Jesus speak and maybe do something amazing in front of their eyes. And so it says here, and this is a different sermon altogether, but it says that Jesus made it a custom to show up to his church. And so, little hint, hint, church is important. If Jesus showed up, uh, we might want to show up too. But that's a different message. I'm going to let Pastor Ryan take care of that. He shows up to his home church, and, and he gets up, and again, they let him speak. Like, here, you preach to us today. So they give him a scroll. He, he opens the scroll. It's the book of Isaiah. In those days, the scroll's going to have chapter numbers like ours. So he has to open this, this long scroll, go straight to Isaiah 61, and he reads the words that we read today. And one thing that struck me as I read this passage is that he is declaring his ministry. He's saying, this is what I came to do. But in no place does he say, I came to die on the cross. He doesn't say, I came to live a righteous life in order to fulfill God's uh, righteous requirement. I came to take the wrath of God. I came to, to save sinners. He doesn't say that. And, and, and I think that if, if we are honest with ourselves, sometimes when we think of the gospel of Jesus Christ or his ministry, his mission, we kind of, and I, I hate to say the word limited because his atonement is unlimited, right? What he did on the cross is an amazing work, but he did more than only that. And my fear is that if we only see the mission of Jesus Christ as his work of a righteous life and his death on a cross, then once we go into that work and we are saved, then we think we are done. And my friends, there's a lot of work to do. There's a lot of work to do. So, so he, he opens the passage to them and he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Just, to, to, just again, so we can understand what's going on around us. The year of the Lord's favor is this idea, this concept that God instituted for his people a long time ago. Every 50 years, everybody would stop working. They would spend a year just kind of worshiping God, and he would bless them. And God gave all these families their own land. But if for some reason over the span of 50 years you had to sell it because you were poor or because uh, something crazy happened and you needed the, the financial stability, you sold your land, at that 50th year, you got your land back. You may think that's unfair, this person bought it outright, but no, it wasn't that person's land, it was God's land. So God says, every 50 years, I'm going to make everything right the way that I planned it to be. 
Maybe somebody was in debt, and so the only way to get out of the debt at that time was to sell yourself into slavery to the person you owed money to, and that way you worked it off. Every 50 years, every single slave was completely released, went back to their family, and everything was set right the way that God called it to be. Later on in Scripture, we see, that's called the year of Jubilee, by the way. Later on in Scripture, we see that God has an even better year of Jubilee plan. It's not just an every 50 year thing. One day, God will set all things right forever and ever, and no one will be in debt to each other. No one especially will be in debt to God because of their sin. He's going to set everything correct. And so Jesus Christ opens the scripture and says, the year of the Lord's favor is here. And how am I going to prove that to you? How will you know that this is the year of the Lord's favor? You will know because you're going to see me proclaim the gospel to the poor. You're going to see me release the captives. You're going to see me give sight to the blind. You're going to see me bring liberty to the oppressed. And if you look at the story of Jesus Christ throughout the Gospels, that is exactly what he did. That is exactly what he did. I'm, uh, I'm going to make a confession to you, and I don't want you to, to leave here running. Um, a couple of confessions. I don't care at all for college basketball or college football. I, at all, it just, it's not my thing, all right? Clemson, you know, all of them, all that stuff, it, it just opened right over my head. Um, and, and even, uh, uh, even more, maybe a more startling confession, you, you might have been able to tell already by the way that I speak in my accent, but uh, uh, what I do care about here in the month of April, all the way to the month of September and October, hopefully, is my beloved New York Yankees. Oh my goodness, I love those. Um, and I know that, that as, as, as uh, good Southern Baptists, that is... Uh, close to heresy, but we uh, grew up in the Bronx. You know, the Yankees are my thing. So, so uh, being a Yankee fan, you probably also made the deduction that I hate the Boston Red Sox, and I use the word hate while standing on the pulpit um, very carefully, but for the Red Sox, it is applicable. Hate the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> and in 2004, the Red Sox, unfortunately, won a championship for the first time in 86 years, and, and they say they had a curse on them, and so they, they finally were able to break the curse, and that was a sad year for, for me uh, and Yankee, the Yankee Empire. They had a general manager by the name of Theo Epstein. Theo Epstein was the Boston Red Sox general manager, and he was brought in to break the curse. That was his job. He was going to break the curse. And so little by little, he built this amazing team of scrappy players that were going to take down the evil empire of the New York Yankees, who had won championship after championship over the late 90s. And, and sure enough, they did it. They did it. They broke the curse. And there was another team uh, in the middle of the country who also had a, a curse of their own, uh, the Chicago Cubs, who had not won a title in more than 100 years. And so Theo Epstein's contract was up, and so the Cubs called him up and said, hey, if you need the guy who breaks curses, uh, you want to come over here and help us out? And so Theo shows up, and he does the same exact thing. He builds a team of scrappy young players, takes his time little by little. The fans notice what this guy is doing. He's building something special little by little versus trying to do it at one shot. And so the fans are excited because they know the curse is about to be broken. The curse is about to be broken. And sure enough, in, oh, was it 2014? The Chicago Cubs finally, 2015, finally won the World Series. Their 107 or eight year curse is broken and the Cubs are now champions. Jesus Christ came to break the curse of the fall. Jesus Christ came to break the curse of the fall. I asked my wife, Randy, what, what did Christ come for? And, and she was kind of startled by it. And she said, he came to take away our sins. And I'm absolutely 100% correct. But in addition to that, the Bible says that he came to crush the head of Satan, who brought about the temptation that brought the curse into the earth. John says in 1 John that he came to destroy the works of Satan. Jesus says that, it, that when the cross is lifted up, he will draw all men unto himself, right? And that the gates of hell will not be able to prevent anybody from coming into the kingdom of God. Jesus Christ came to break the curse, and he showed it to them. He showed it to them by doing these amazing miracles, these amazing works. He came to show and tell. Now, what does it look like? What, 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 what did it look like for Jesus Christ to minister for three years in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and some of these other areas uh, where Israel currently is. And, 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 and what is it like for him to show and tell? It says here that he came to preach the good news to the poor. And one day, John 6, uh, Jesus is walking uh, towards Jerusalem, and thousands of people start following him. The Bible says that 5,000 men, not counting the women and children, are walking with him. 
They want to hear everything else to say because they, they, there's a spark. Like people are starting to maybe believe that this could be the Messiah, the one who came to free them from the Roman government and from world systems and would, and would bring about the, the, the age of where, where, where the Messiah rules. And, and it says that Jesus had compassion for them because they were walking for a long time. They're getting hungry. It's getting late. There's no place to get food. And he has, I mean, what do you estimate? 5,000 men with women and children? Maybe 20,000 people following behind? Mm -hmm. And so he says, let's give these people some food. He, he, he finds a lunchable, snack pack sized kid's meal. And out of that, makes food to feed all these people and have some left over. He cares about the poverty of the poor and gives them something to eat. He fills their stomachs. But then he says, I just showed you something. I just showed you that I can feed you the way that God fed the Israelites in the desert. I can do the same thing because I am, but I am God Himself. I am the Son of God. I do the things that God has shown me to do. But I have better food for you. You see, because you're going to be hungry again tomorrow. Okay? And in fact, that's what happened. They came back the next day saying, Give us more food. He says, Uh uh, I got better food for you. He says, You're hungry now, but your spirits are starving. Your spirits have such a lack of God that they are emaciated. And if you were to just eat my flesh and drink my blood, meaning if you were to depend on the suffering that I'm going to partake of in the cross, and if you were to depend on the death that I'm going to take up, take up on the cross, if you were to depend on that for your own righteousness, instead of trying to come to God with, with the hand, your hands full of your own good works, just depend on what I will do. And God will accept you. If you do that, you will be satisfied forever. You will enter into that year of the Lord's favor. Where he rules over your life wonderfully, beautifully. Not as a dictator, not, not as a dominating figure, but as someone who wants to just pour out love. You will rule over your life. And you won't ever lack a single thing before me. So he takes the physical feeding of them, which is an amazing miracle. He shows them what life will be like in the kingdom. And then tells them this is what it really means. He shows and tells you heard the story today that my wife uh, told the kids. Here's this man who has leprosy. And leprosy meant you were not just sick, but you were also unclean. And there's a difference. He has sickness in his body, but the uncleanness kept him from going into the city of Jerusalem, much less into the temple to offer sacrifices to God. Imagine in this day and time when you had to offer sacrifices for the forgiveness of sins. And he is unable to do just that. Now, the thing is that people would not minister to him because they didn't want themselves to be impure, you know, uh, unclean to go into the temple. So they just left them to be. But Jesus Christ sees him and says, I am willing to clean you. He touches him. And like I said, cooties don't go on to Jesus. The goodness of Jesus rubs off on us. And so now this man, the very first command that, God, that Jesus gives him is, go show yourself to the priest to fulfill the requirement of Moses, give the sacrifice, go worship. You, have, you are no longer being kept from the presence of God. You can go worship. That is exactly what Jesus does for us on a daily basis. On a daily basis. We don't deserve to go before God. We don't deserve to have access to his throne. But he touches us, removes our unworthiness, removes our uncleanness, replaces it with his goodness, his righteousness. And now we, we have the great privilege of going to God in prayer. Amen. Believer, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, do not neglect assembling yourself with the saints. Do not neglect coming to church and worshiping God. It is a privilege. It is, it is just a, a beautiful thing that God has given us that we can take for granted so easily. There's, a, there's a, a passage in scripture in uh, Luke chapter 13. There's a, there's a woman who is oppressed by satanic spirits. And the way that these spirits oppress her is that it's caused her to walk bent over for 18 years. 18 years walking like this. I don't know how this woman became possessed by spirits. I don't know how this woman became, uh, uh, why this happened. It might have been a sin issue. It might have just been something that God allowed for this very moment. We don't know those, the, that answer to the question. And so we just read what the Bible says. And it says that she showed up to the synagogue on a Sabbath day, the day of rest, the day when people did nothing but just listen to the word being preached and worship and just kind of enjoy God's goodness. She shows up to the, to, the, uh, to the synagogue, and Jesus Christ looks at her and says, I want to heal this woman. 
and he frees her from this demonic uh, oppression, and she stands up straight, and the people are wondering, wow, this is amazing. But the religious leaders say, it's a day of rest. What are you doing making miracles? That's work. <laughs> please, let's not, let's not be like that, please, believers. Let's not be religious people who miss the grace of God for the sake of our traditions. Anyway, so, so listen to the words that he says about this woman. He says, this daughter of Abraham was oppressed by Satan. It is fitting that on this day of rest, on the Sabbath day, she is made well. This woman was oppressed by Satan, and Jesus heals her, frees her, and then calls her a daughter of Abraham. Brings her into the family of God. And, and, and there's so many miracles. People, people look at the Bible as being a book full of miracles, and really Moses did a couple and, you know, with God's power. Elijah and Elisha did a couple with God's power. It, really, there aren't that many things in there. But Jesus shows up, and there's an explosion of miracles. Right? John says that there's even more great works that he did that we could have put in the book. Jesus Christ is walking around showing and telling what life is like when we are free from the curse. And, and we can amen to that because that is... That tells us the goodness of Jesus Christ, but then he, he, here's the thing, though. Here's, here's, the, here's the fine print. The fine print is that we have also been called to do these very works. We have also been called to do these very works. What do I mean? One of the last things that Jesus tells his disciples is that they're going to do greater works than Jesus Christ did. In John 17, he's praying to the Father, and he says, how, I, how you sent me, I sent them into the world. And, and from John 15 on, like 15, 16, uh, 14, 15, 16, he was just telling them, it is good that I leave. It is good that I leave, because when I leave, I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. The way that the Holy Spirit rested on Jesus and caused them to, to, to fight temptation and overcome and, and come out of that desert and, and just bless people on the way to Nazareth. That very same spirit is the spirit that's given to us. Remember Pastor Ryan's sermon from last week? The Holy Spirit, we don't, we, don't get a, we don't get a diminished version of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, right? The Spirit of God. And it doesn't change. So it's given to us so that we can do the works that Christ has commanded us to do. And the works that he's commanded us to do is what? Preach the gospel to the world. Right? It may be that you preach to somebody who is you know, physically, literally poor. And, and through your generosity and through your prayers, God answers and blesses them in, 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 a, in a mighty way. But maybe he won't. Maybe he won't. Maybe, maybe the uh, financial struggle and, and not having enough is something that they will have to deal with for the rest of their lives. But one thing is for certain. When they show up to heaven, they won't show up with bankrupted pockets and hands. They'll show up carrying the riches of Jesus Christ, his righteousness, and saying, this is what I have to offer no longer poor. And that applies to you, believer, if, if you're struggling, if, if you can't make ends meet. It may be that God will, will give you something amazing and bring you out of that. It may be that he keeps you in that place. Proverbs, the, the, the writer says, um, God, don't give me so much that I forget about you. Don't give me so little that I steal from you, that I, that I steal to, to, to get something back. Like, Sometimes he wants us in that place of dependence. But one thing is for certain, we will not lack anything when we get before the throne room of God. We'll have everything we'll need, namely the person of Jesus Christ. Man, the pro great price. It may be that, that God calls you into a place to, to, to touch the sick, to touch the untouchable. And it may be that, that you pray and God does the miraculous and heals them on the spot. I know for a fact there are people in this room who have a testimony about how God healed their bodies. Know for a fact. And I know for a fact that more of us in this room have a testimony where God didn't answer that prayer. But he increased our faith. He increased our hope for a day when all sickness will be destroyed, all disease will be banished, and we'll have new bodies enjoying God's presence forever. And whether he heals or not, whether he heals you or someone you're praying for or not, if you believe in Jesus Christ, you're going to you're going to have a new body. You're going to have a, 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 a new life with him, free from the curse, free from the fall. Amen. It may be that 
someone you know is, is going through oppression right now, uh, satanic oppression, it, it may be from, from addictions. It may be from, from uh, addictions to pornography, addictions to drugs, addictions to alcohol that keeps you in a constant state of oppression. Or even, you may come across people who are in systems, world system, political system, economic system that keeps them back against the wall and they can't take a step forward. That's oppression as well, by the way, because that woman who was bent over, she was being oppressed by, by satanic powers, but also the religious system did not want her to be healed that day. We have people right across the street from over here who are under religious oppression right now. And it may be that, that, that God uses you to free them from these things, or it may be that God places you in their life in order that you may walk with them for a lifetime as they deal with these issues. But one thing is for certain. Believers in Jesus Christ, though they may struggle with temptation and sin, have been freed from the grip, from the curse, from the condemnation that comes from sin. And that may be you today as a believer. It may be that you're struggling with something that, that no one knows about. My friend, please, find someone who turns you to trust and lay your, just lay your heart bare so that they can help you carry that burden. You can't be free if nobody knows that you're a captive right now. It may be that God calls you to some sort of prison ministry or refugee ministry or, or, or something where, where somebody is in a situation that one can argue they did it to themselves. <laughs> they did it to themselves. But that's okay. They did it to themselves, but then Christ frees them by himself. So let's, 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 let's just be ready and willing to do the amazing works that Jesus Christ did during his time on earth. See, we, we're very good. We understand the mission of the cross. He came to live a righteous life. He came to die a, de a death on our place. He rose again to beating death and sin. And so we accept that, believe it, and we walk in it. But we can't do that for people. We can't atone for people's sins. So if, if, if the only interaction we have with Jesus Christ is in believing these things, but we don't look at what he did and follow his example and what he did, then we're just going to be on the sidelines. And, and what, what I don't want to be is I, I don't want to be someone who benefits from Jesus Christ and doesn't, be, doesn't benefit others for Jesus Christ. We are um, show and tell. I think we know that there are churches out there who, who claim Christ and they're really good at showing and they do a lot of charity work and, and things like that, but maybe they 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 they, they stagger when it comes to the tell part, right? Maybe they're not so secure in their beliefs about Jesus. To them, the best thing we can do in the name of Jesus Christ is, is social gospel type work and healing people or taking care of people and that's it, doesn't go further. I told Pastor Ryan, I'm not, a, I'm not a pep rally guy, so I don't want to spend time talking about those churches. I want to talk about us. And I think where we struggle is we love to tell. We love to tell. We will tell that whole story about Jesus came from glory, right? We sang it today. But do we show well? Do we show well? Are we going to the untouchables in our city and around the world and saying, I will embrace you and I'll give you the words of Jesus Christ? I will feed you, and I will give you the words of Jesus Christ. It was a beautiful thing volunteering at the at the, at the church of our church soup kitchens that week, and my wife been going out on a weekly basis to help out, and that's just that's just a beautiful thing that we get to do. We get to show, and we get to tell, and we must be willing to do both. If the works of Christ pointed forward to a day when we will be free from the curse, where we can enjoy freedom from the curse, then the works of the church point backwards to that day when we step into the freedom that comes from Jesus Christ. We point backwards to that day when we, we saw Jesus for who he really uh, was, believed on him, trusted him, and now we are able to experience a life that is free from the condemnation of sin, from the effects of the curse. And we still have to experience them. We get sick, right? We die. <laughs> we struggle. But those things no longer have a hold on us. They don't dominate us. They don't crush our spirits because we have them. And so my desire is that you would see your mission 
the same as the commission of Jesus Christ to show and tell the goodness of God. Show and tell. He's so good to us. We don't deserve anything. We don't deserve anything other than wrath. And yet, he gives us goodness. He gives us his life for our, for our sin, for our unrighteousness. And so, as believers, shouldn't we be just chomping at the bit? See, because what Jesus did is he previewed, previewed life without the curse. What we get to do is that we get to review it now. We get to go all over the world and tell people this is what Jesus is all about. The mission of our church is to glorify God by making disciples in our city and around the world. If we are going to be serious about that mission, then we need to look at Jesus Christ and see how he accomplished that mission because it was his very mission as well. And when he ascended, before he went to heaven to sit with the Father, he gave us that command. You know it, the Great Commission. He says, all things have been given unto me, therefore go into all the world, making disciples of all the nations, baptizing uh, them, and teaching them to obey the things I have commanded, and lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So he, he gave us our marching orders. This is not uh, up for debate. Our commander has given the command. And when we finally decide to take on the mission of Jesus Christ and do it in the way that Jesus Christ has asked us to do it, has told us to do it, has shown us to do it, then we will truly be commissioned with Jesus Christ. Now, if there may be, there may be some believers here right now who, who are looking back on, on their life as believers and, and just have always have had that passion to serve others, to, to give of themselves, to, to demonstrate Christ to the world, and you just haven't had a way to express it, don't know how to do it. My friend, if you want to serve people, if you want to make disciples in this city and around the world, I invite you, hey, in a few moments, you just, just come up. Talk to Pastor Brian and just tell him, this is in my heart. I want to do this. How can I serve here? And, and, and I'm sure that he'll find a way to get you trained up and, and discipled and sent out to do whatever God, God put in your heart. So if that's in your heart, come up. Now, it may be that some of you here are sitting saying, I have benefited from the person of Jesus Christ my whole life, and I don't know if I've been a benefit to others. There's no shame in that. What there is that is that it is confession. And coming to God and saying, make me someone who has a passion for people who have not benefited from your grace like I have. And I invite you to come up and talk to Pastor Ryan and say, I want to do more. I want to share the blessings that I've received from Jesus Christ with others. And finally, there may be some here who this thing about Jesus Christ has always been kind of nebulous and unclear and you know, this is, this, is, this is for my mom and my grandma. It's not really for me. You know, I just bring the kids because I want them to grow up the more. That may be you. And, and, and if that's you, praise God that you're here. This is not to condemn you at all. God has made an appointment for you today to be here to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ preached. And my desire is, if you have not thought about the fact that one day you'll stand before God and you, you, you have to answer for what you did with the information about Jesus Christ and God is going to ask you, what do you bring on your behalf? What is your witness for your goodness? You're going to have nothing in your hands because we, we all sin, we all fall short. My desire is that today you would say, I want to take the righteousness of Christ, exchange it for my sin, so that I may stand before God one day and say, I have Jesus. Is this good enough to get in? The answer is going to be yes. If you've never, if you've never believed that or, 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 or repented from your sin and taken on the righteousness of Christ for yourself and you have not become a Christian, please come up. Today is the day of salvation. Please come up. So, my Pastor Ryan just come up and uh, position himself to, to welcome anybody who wants to speak uh, before you, so we're going to close the prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and thank you for uh, speaking today. And my Lord, I am an imperfect messenger of the gospel. We all are, but we look to you, Jesus Christ, the perfect messenger and message of the gospel. My God, I pray, oh, Holy Spirit, I pray that just as you moved over the darkness and the waters, Lord, in creation, I pray that today you will move in the hearts of those whose hearts have not been regenerated, remade in the name of Jesus Christ. My Lord, I pray that today be the day of salvation for many.
And Jesus, I pray you would make us, just make us obedient as believers, make us obedient to do what you call us to do and to not, not shrink away from our responsibilities, to our duties, from our orders that you've given us, but to embrace them fully and, and represent you well unto the day.